The history of Puerto Ricans of African descent begins with free African men, known as libertos, who accompanied the Spanish conquistadors in the invasion of the island. The Spaniards enslaved the Tainos the native inhabitants of the island, many of whom died as a result of new infectious diseases and the Spaniards' oppressive colonization efforts. Spain's royal government needed laborers and began to rely on slavery to staff their mining and fort building operations. The Crown authorized importing enslaved West Africans. As a result, the majority of the African peoples who entered Puerto Rico were part of the forced migration of the Atlantic slave trade, and came from many different cultures and peoples of the African continent. When the gold mines in Puerto Rico were declared depleted, the Spanish Crown no longer considered the island to be a high colonial priority. Its chief port served primarily as a garrison to support naval vessels. The Spaniards encouraged free people of color from British and French possessions in the Caribbean to emigrate to Puerto Rico, to provide a population base to support the Puerto Rican garrison. The Spanish Decree of 1789 allowed slaves to earn or buy their freedom, however, this did little to help their situation. The expansion of sugar cane plantations drove up demand for labor and the slave population increased dramatically as new slaves were imported. Throughout the years, there were many slave revolts in the island. Slaves who were promised their freedom joined the 1868 uprising against Spanish colonial rule in what is known as the Grito de Lares. On March 22, 1873, slavery was abolished in Puerto Rico. The contributions of ethnic Africans to the music, art, language, and heritage have been instrumental in Puerto Rican culture. <laughs> First Africans in Puerto Rico When Ponce de Leon and the Spaniards arrived on the island of Boracan, Puerto Rico, they were greeted by the cacique Ahuabana, the supreme leader of the peaceful Taino tribes on the island. Ahuabana helped to maintain the peace between the Taino and the Spaniards. According to historian Ricardo Alegría, in 1509 Juan Garrido was the first free black man to set foot on the island, he was a conquistador who was part of Juan Ponce de Leon's entourage. Garrido was born on the West African coast, the son of an African king. In 1508, he joined Juan Ponce de Leon to explore Puerto Rico and prospect for gold. In 1511, he fought under Ponce de Leon to repress the Carib and the Taino, who had joined forces in Puerto Rico in a great revolt against the Spaniards. Garrido next joined Hernán Cortés in the Spanish conquest of Mexico. Another free black man who accompanied de Leon was Pedro Mejías. Mejías married a Taino woman chief a Kakaka, by the name of Uisa. Uisa was baptized as Catholic so that she could marry Mejías. She was given the Christian name of Luisa the town Loiza, Puerto Rico was named for her. The peace between the Spanish and the Taino was short-lived. The Spanish took advantage of the Taino's good faith and enslaved them, forcing them to work in the gold mines and in the construction of forts. Many Taino died, particularly due to epidemics of smallpox, to which they had no immunity. Other Tainos committed suicide or left the island after the failed Taino revolt of 1511. Friar Bartolomé de las Casas, who had accompanied Ponce de Leon, was outraged at the Spanish treatment of the Taino. In 1512 he protested at the Council of Burgos at the Spanish court. He fought for the freedom of the natives and was able to secure their rights. The Spanish colonists, fearing the loss of their labor force, also protested before the courts. They complained that they needed manpower to work in the mines, build forts, and supply labor for the thriving sugar cane plantations. As an alternative, Las Casas suggested the importation and use of African slaves. In 1517, the Spanish crown permitted its subjects to import 12 slaves each, thereby beginning the slave trade in their colonies. According to historian Luis M. Diaz, the largest contingent of African slaves came from the areas of the present day Gold Coast, Nigeria, and Dahomey, and the region known as the area of Guineas, together known as the Slave Coast. The vast majority were Yorubas and Igbos, ethnic groups from Nigeria, and Bantus from the Guineas. The number of slaves in Puerto Rico rose from 1,500 in 1530 to 15,000 by 1555. The slaves were stamped with a hot iron on the forehead, a branding which meant that they were brought to the country legally and prevented their kidnapping. African slaves were sent to work in the gold mines to replace the Taino, or to work in the fields in the island's ginger and sugar industries. They were allowed to live with their families in a bohio hut on the master's land, and were given a patch of land where they could plant and grow vegetables and fruits. 
Blacks had little or no opportunity for advancement and faced discrimination from the Spaniards. Slaves were educated by their masters and soon learned to speak the master's language, educating their own children in the new language. They enriched the Puerto Rican Spanish language by adding words of their own. The Spaniards considered the blacks superior to the Taino, since the latter were unwilling to assimilate. The slaves, in contrast, had little choice but to adapt to their lives. Many converted at least nominally to Christianity, they were baptized by the Catholic Church and were given the surnames of their masters. Many slaves were subject to harsh treatment, and women were subject to sexual abuse because of the power relationships. The majority of the conquistadors and farmers who settled the island had arrived without women, many of them intermarried with the blacks or Tainos. Their mixed race descendants formed the first generations of the early Puerto Rican population. In 1527, the first major slave rebellion occurred in Puerto Rico, as dozens of slaves fought against the colonists in a brief revolt. The few slaves who escaped retreated to the mountains, where they resided as maroons with surviving Tainos. During the following centuries, by 1873 slaves had carried out more than 20 revolts. Some were of great political importance, such as the Ponce and Vega Baja conspiracies. By 1570, the colonists found that the gold mines were depleted. After gold mining ended on the island, the Spanish crown bypassed Puerto Rico by moving the western shipping routes to the north. The island became primarily a garrison for those ships that would pass on their way to or from richer colonies. The cultivation of crops such as tobacco, cotton, cocoa, and ginger became the cornerstone of the economy. With the scale of Puerto Rico's economy reduced, colonial families tended to farm these crops themselves, and the demand for slaves was reduced. With rising demand for sugar on the international market, major planters increased their cultivation and processing of sugar cane, which was labor-intensive. Sugar plantations supplanted mining as Puerto Rico's main industry and kept demand high for African slavery. Spain promoted sugar cane development by granting loans and tax exemptions to the owners of the plantations. They were also given permits to participate in the African slave trade, to attract more workers. In 1664, Spain offered freedom and land to African descended people from non Spanish colonies, such as Jamaica and Saint Domingue. Later Haiti. Most of the free people of color who were able to immigrate were of mixed race, with African and European ancestry, typically either British or French paternal ancestry. Depending on the colony, the immigrants provided a population base to support the Puerto Rican garrison and its forts. Freedmen who settled the western and southern parts of the island soon adopted the ways and customs of the Spaniards. Some joined the local militia, which fought against the British in the many British attempts to invade the island. The escaped slaves and the freedmen who emigrated from the West Indies used their former master's surnames, which were typically either English or French. In the 21st century, some ethnic African Puerto Ricans still carry non Spanish surnames, proof of their descent from these immigrants. After 1784, Spain suspended the use of hot branding the slave's forehead for identification. In addition, it provided ways by which slaves could obtain freedom. A slave could be freed by his master in a church or outside it, before a judge, by testament or letter. A slave could be freed against his master's will by denouncing a forced rape, by denouncing a counterfeiter, by discovering disloyalty against the king, and by denouncing murder against his master. Any slave who received part of his master's estate in his master's will was automatically freed. These bequests were sometimes made to the master's mixed race slave children, as well as to other slaves for service. If a slave was made a guardian to his master's children, he was freed. If slave parents in Hispanic America had ten children, the whole family was freed. <inaudible> <inaudible> Royal Decree of Graces of 1789 In 1789, the Spanish crown issued the Royal Decree of Graces of 1789 which set new rules related to the slave trade and added restrictions to the granting of freedmen status. The decree granted its subjects the right to purchase slaves and to participate in the flourishing slave trade in the Caribbean. Later that year a new slave code, also known as El Codigo Negro, the Black Code, was introduced, under El Codigo Negro. A slave could buy his freedom, in the event that his master was willing to sell, by paying the price sought. Slaves were allowed to earn money during their spare time by working as shoemakers, cleaning clothes, or selling the produce they grew on their own plots of land. 
Slaves were able to pay for their freedom by installments. They pay in installments for the freedom of their newborn child, not yet baptized, at a cost of half the going price for a baptized child. Many of these freedmen started settlements in the areas which became known as Cangreos Santerse, Carolina, Canavanas, Loiza, and Luquillo. Some became slave owners themselves, the native-born Puerto Ricans Criolos who wanted to serve in the regular Spanish army petitioned the Spanish crown for that right. In 1741, the Spanish government established the Regimiento Fijo de Puerto Rico. Many of the former slaves, now freedmen, joined either the Fijo or the local civil militia. Puerto Ricans of African ancestry played an instrumental role in the defeat of Sir Ralph Abercrombie in the British invasion of Puerto Rico in 1797. Despite these paths to freedom, from 1790 onwards, the number of slaves more than doubled in Puerto Rico as a result of the dramatic expansion of the sugar industry in the island. Every aspect of sugar cultivation, harvesting, and processing was arduous and harsh. Many slaves died on the sugar plantations. topic 19th century topic <inaudible> notable puerto ricans of african descent rafael cordero 1792-1868 was born free in san juan puerto rico of african descent he became known as the father of public education in puerto rico Cordero was a self-educated Puerto Rican who provided free schooling to children regardless of their race. Among the distinguished alumni who attended Cordero's school were future abolitionists Roman Baldoriotti de Castro, Alejandro Tapia y Rivera, and José Julian Acosta. Cordero proved that racial and economic integration could be possible and accepted in Puerto Rico. In 2004, the Roman Catholic Church, upon the request of San Juan Archbishop Roberto González Nieves, began the process of Cordero's beatification. He was not the only one in his family to become an educator. In 1820, his older sister, Celestina Cordero, established the first school for girls in San Juan. José Campeche (1751–1809), born a free man, contributed to the island's culture. Campeche's father, Tomás Campeche, was a freed slave born in Puerto Rico, and his mother Maria Jordan Marques came from the Canary Islands. Since she was considered European or white, her children were born free. Of mixed race, Campeche was classified as a mulatto, a common term during his time meaning of African-European descent. Campeche is considered to be the foremost Puerto Rican painter of religious themes of the era. Capt. Miguel Henriquez c. 1680-17, was a former pirate who became Puerto Rico's first black military hero by organizing an expeditionary force that defeated the British in the island of Vieques. Capt. Enriquez was received as a national hero when he returned the island of Vieques back to the Spanish Empire and Puerto Rico. He was awarded La Medalla de Oro de la Real Efigie, and the Spanish crown named him Captain of the Seas awarding him a letter of mark and reprisal which granted him the privileges of a privateer. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Royal Decree of Graces of 1815. The Royal Decree of Graces of 1815 was intended to encourage Spaniards and later other Europeans to settle and populate the colonies of Cuba and Puerto Rico. The decree encouraged the use of slave labor to revive agriculture and attract new settlers. The new agricultural class immigrating from other countries of Europe used slave labor in large numbers, and harsh treatment was frequent. The slaves resisted from the early 1820s until 1868. A series of slave uprisings occurred on the island, the last was known as the Grito de Lares. In July 1821, for instance, the slave Marcos Choro planned and conspired to lead a slave revolt against the sugar plantation owners and the Spanish colonial government. Although the conspiracy was suppressed, Choro achieved legendary status among the slaves, and is part of Puerto Rico's heroic folklore. The 1834 Royal Census of Puerto Rico established that 11% of the population were slaves, 35% were colored freemen, also known as free people of color in French colonies, meaning people of mixed race, and 54% were white. 
In the following decade, the number of the slave population increased more than tenfold to 258,000, the result mostly of increased importation to meet the demand for labor on sugar plantations. Planters became nervous because of so many slaves, they ordered restrictions, particularly of their movements off a plantation. Rose Clemente, a 21st century black Puerto Rican columnist, wrote, until 1846, blacks on the island had to carry a notebook libretta system to move around the island, like the passbook system in apartheid South Africa." After the successful slave rebellion against the French in Saint-Domingue in 1803, establishing a new republic, the Spanish crown became fearful that the Criollos native-born of Puerto Rico and Cuba, her last two remaining possessions, might follow suit. The Spanish government issued the Royal Decree of Graces of 1815 to attract European immigrants from non-Spanish countries to populate the island, believing that these new immigrants would be more loyal to Spain than the mixed-race Criollos. However, they did not expect the new immigrants to racially intermarry, as they did, and to identify completely with their new homeland. By 1850, most of the former Spanish possessions in the Americans had achieved independence. On May 31, 1848, the governor of Puerto Rico Juan Prim, in fear of an independence or slavery revolt, imposed draconian laws, El Bando contra la Raza Africana, to control the behavior of all black Puerto Ricans, free or slave. On September 23, 1868, slaves, who had been promised freedom, participated in the short failed revolt against Spain, which became known as El Grito de Larry's, or the Cry of Larry's. Many of the participants were imprisoned or executed. During this period, Puerto Rico provided a means for people to leave some of the racial restrictions behind, under such laws as Regla del Sicar or Gracias al Sicar. A person of African ancestry could be considered legally white if able to prove they also had ancestors with at least one person per generation in the last four generations who had been legally white. Therefore, people of black ancestry with known white lineage became classified as white. This was the opposite of the later one-drop rule of hypodescent in the United States, whereby persons of any known African ancestry were classified as black. As white Democrats regained power in state legislatures after the Reconstruction era, they asserted white supremacy, and passed laws for racial segregation and Jim Crow. The one-drop rule was formalized in laws passed in the South in the early 20th century, after the whites had disenfranchised most blacks at the turn of the century by creating barriers to voter registration and voting. During the 19th century, however, many southern states had looser constructions of race. In early 19th century Virginia, for instance, if a person was seven eighths white and free, the individual was considered legally white. Children born to slave mothers were considered slaves, no matter what their ancestry, and many were of mixed heritage. Among the most famous were the mixed race children of Thomas Jefferson by his slave Sally Hemings. He freed all four surviving children when they came of age, too informally, by letting them walk away," and the two younger sons in his will. <inaudible> Abolitionists During the mid-19th century, a committee of abolitionists was formed in Puerto Rico that included many prominent Puerto Ricans. Dr. Ramon Emeterio Betances (1827–1898), whose parents were wealthy landowners, believed in abolitionism, and together with fellow Puerto Rican abolitionist Segundo Ruiz Belvis (1829–1867), founded a clandestine organization called the Secret Abolitionist Society. The objective of the society was to free slave children by paying for freedom when they were baptized. The event, which was also known as Aguas de Libertad. Waters of Liberty, was carried out at the Nuestra Señora de la Candelaria Cathedral in Mayaguez. When the child was baptized, Betances would give money to the parents, which they used to buy the child's freedom from the master. José Julián Acosta (1827–1891) was a member of a Puerto Rican commission, which included Ramón Emeterio Betances, Segundo Ruiz Belvis, and Francisco Mariano Quiñones (1830–1908). The commission participated in the. Overseas Information Committee, which met in Madrid, Spain. There, Acosta presented the argument for the abolition of slavery in Puerto Rico. 
On November 19, 1872, Roman Baldorio T. de Castro (1822–1889), together with Luis Padial (1832–1879), Julio Viscarondo (1832–1889), and the Spanish Minister of Overseas Affairs, Segismundo Morat (1833–1913), presented a proposal for the abolition of slavery. On March 22, 1873, the Spanish government approved what became known as the Morat Law, which provided for gradual abolition. This edict granted freedom to slaves over 60 years of age, those belonging to the state, and children born to slaves after September 17, 1868. The Morat Law established the Central Slave Registrar. In 1872 it began gathering the following data on the island's slave population, name, country of origin, present residence, names of parents, sex, marital status, trade, age, physical description, and master's name. This has been an invaluable resource for historians and genealogists. <inaudible> Abolition of slavery On March 22, 1873, slavery was «abolished» in Puerto Rico, but with one significant caveat. The slaves were not emancipated, they had to buy their own freedom, at whatever price was set by their last masters. The law required that the former slaves work for another three years for their former masters, other people interested in their services, or for the state. In order to pay some compensation, the former slaves earned money in a variety of ways, some by trades, for instance as shoemakers, or laundering clothes, or by selling the produce they were allowed to grow, in the small patches of land allotted to them by their former masters. In a sense, they resembled the black sharecroppers of the southern U.S. after the American Civil War, but the latter did not own their land. They simply farmed another's land, for a share of the crops raised. The government created the Protector's Office which was in charge of overseeing the transition. The Protector's Office was to pay any difference owed to the former master once the initial contract expired. The majority of the freed slaves continued to work for their former masters, but as free people, receiving wages for their labor. If the former slave decided not to work for his former master, the protector's office would pay the former master 23% of the former slave's estimated value. As a form of compensation, the freed slaves became integrated into Puerto Rico's society. Racism has existed in Puerto Rico, but it is not considered to be as severe as other places in the New World, possibly because of the following factors. In the 8th century, nearly all of Spain was conquered 711 to 718 by the Muslim Moors who had crossed over from North Africa. The first Africans were brought to Spain during Arab domination by North African merchants. By the middle of the 13th century, Christians had reconquered the Iberian Peninsula. A section of Seville, which once was a Moorish stronghold, was inhabited by thousands of Africans. Africans became freemen after converting to Christianity, and they lived integrated in Spanish society. African women were highly sought after by Spanish males. Spain's exposure to people of color over the centuries accounted for the positive racial attitudes that prevailed in the New World. Historian Robert Martinez thought it was unsurprising that the first conquistadors intermarried with the native Taino and later with the African immigrants. The Catholic Church played an instrumental role in preserving the human dignity and working for the social integration of the African man in Puerto Rico. The Church insisted that every slave be baptized and converted to the Catholic faith. Church doctrine held that master and slave were equal before the eyes of God, and therefore brothers in Christ with a common moral and religious character. Cruel and unusual punishment of slaves was considered a violation of the Fifth Commandment. When the gold mines were declared depleted in 1570 and mining came to an end in Puerto Rico, the majority of the white Spanish settlers left the island to seek their fortunes in the richer colonies such as Mexico, the island became a Spanish garrison. The majority of those who stayed behind were either African or mulattoes of mixed race. By the time Spain re-established commercial ties with Puerto Rico, the island had a large multiracial population. After the Spanish crown issued the Royal Decree of Graces of 1815, it attracted many European immigrants, in effect, whitening the island into the 1850s. But, the new arrivals also intermarried with native islanders, and added to the multiracial population. They also identified with the island, rather than simply with the rulers. 
Two Puerto Rican writers have written about racism, Abelardo Díaz Alfaro and Luis Palais Matos who was credited with creating the poetry genre known as afro antillano <laughs> Spanish–American War The Treaty of Paris of 1898 settled the Spanish–American War, which ended the centuries-long Spanish control over Puerto Rico. Like with other former Spanish colonies, it now belonged to the United States. With the U.S. control over the island's institutions also came a reduction of the natives' political participation. In effect, the U.S. military government defeated the success of decades of negotiations for political autonomy between Puerto Rico's political class and Madrid's colonial administration. Puerto Ricans of African descent, aware of the opportunities and difficulties for blacks in the U.S., responded in various ways. The racial bigotry of the Jim Crow laws stood in contrast to the African-American expansion of mobility that the Harlem Renaissance illustrated. One Puerto Rican politician of African descent who distinguished himself during this period was the physician and politician José Celso Barbosa (1857–1921). On July 4, 1899, he founded the pro-statehood Puerto Rican Republican Party and became known as the Father of the Statehood for Puerto Rico movement. Another distinguished Puerto Rican of African descent, who advocated Puerto Rico's independence, was Arturo Alfonso Schomburg (1874–1938). After emigrating to New York City in the United States, he amassed an extensive collection in preserving manuscripts and other materials of Black Americans and the African diaspora. He is considered by some to be the father of black history in the United States, and a major study center and collection of the New York Public Library is named for him, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. He coined the term Afroborincano, meaning African Puerto Rican. <laughs> Discrimination After the United States Congress approved the Jones Act of 1917, Puerto Ricans were granted U.S. citizenship. As citizens Puerto Ricans were eligible for the military draft, and many were drafted into the armed forces of the United States during World War I. The armed forces were segregated until after World War II. Puerto Ricans of African descent were subject to the discrimination which was rampant in the military and the U.S. black Puerto Ricans residing in the mainland United States were assigned to all black units. Rafael Hernandez and his brother Jesus, along with 16 more Puerto Ricans, were recruited by jazz bandleader James Reese Europe to join the United States Army's Orchestra Europe. They were assigned to the 369th Infantry Regiment, an African-American regiment. It gained fame during World War I and was nicknamed the Harlem Hell Fighters. By the Germans, the United States also segregated military units in Puerto Rico. Pedro Albizu Campos (1891–1965), who later became the leader of the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, held the rank of lieutenant. He founded the Home Guard unit of Ponce and was later assigned to the 375th Infantry Regiment, an all-black Puerto Rican regiment, which was stationed in Puerto Rico and never saw combat. Albizu Campos later said that the discrimination which he witnessed in the armed forces influenced the development of his political beliefs. Puerto Ricans of African descent were discriminated against in sports. Puerto Ricans who were dark skinned and wanted to play Major League Baseball in the United States were not allowed to do so. In 1892, organized baseball had codified a color line, barring African American players, and any player who was dark skinned, from any country. Ethnic African Puerto Ricans continued to play baseball. In 1928, Emilio Melito Navarro traveled to New York City and became the first Puerto Rican to play baseball in the Negro Leagues when he joined the Cuban Stars. He was later followed by others such as Francisco Quamber, who also played for the Cuban Stars. The persistence of these men paved the way for the likes of Baseball Hall of Famers Roberto Clemente and Orlando Cepeda, who played in the major leagues after the color line was broken by Jackie Robinson of the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. They were inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame for their achievements. Cepeda's father Pedro Cepeda, was denied a shot at the major leagues because of his color. 
Pedro Cepeda was one of the greatest players of his generation, the dominant hitter in the Professional Baseball League of Puerto Rico after its founding in 1938. He refused to play in the Negro Leagues due to his abhorrence of the racism endemic to the segregated United States. Black Puerto Ricans also participated in other sports as international contestants. In 1917, Nero Chen became the first Puerto Rican boxer to gain international recognition when he fought against Panama Joe Gunn at the Palace Casino in New York. In the 1948 Summer Olympics, the 14 Olympics, celebrated in London, boxer Juan Evangelista Venegas made sports history by becoming Puerto Rico's first Olympic medal winner when he beat Belgium's representative, Callan Boat, on points for a unanimous decision. He won the bronze medal in boxing in the bantamweight division. The event was also historic because it was the first time that Puerto Rico had participated as a nation in an international sporting event. It was common for impoverished Puerto Ricans to use boxing as a way to earn an income. On March 30, 1965, Jose Chegui Torres defeated Willie Pastrano by technical knockout and won the World Boxing Council and World Boxing Association Light Heavyweight Championships. He became the third Puerto Rican and the first one of African descent to win a professional world championship. Among those who exposed the racism and discrimination in the U.S. which Puerto Ricans, especially black Puerto Ricans, were subject to, was Jesus Colon. Colon is considered by many as the father of the New Yorkan movement. He recounted his experiences in New York as a black Puerto Rican in his book Lo que el pueblo me dice, Crónicas de la Colonia Puertorriqueña en Nueva York What the People Tell Me, Chronicles of the Puerto Rican Colony in New York. Critics of discrimination say that a majority of Puerto Ricans are racially mixed, but that they do not feel the need to identify as such. They argue that Puerto Ricans tend to assume that they are of black African, American Indian, and European ancestry and only identify themselves as mixed only if they have parents who appear to be of distinctly different races. Puerto Rico underwent a whitening process while under U.S. rule. There was a dramatic change in the numbers of people who were classified as black and white Puerto Ricans in the 1920 census, as compared to that in 1910. The numbers classified as black declined sharply from one census to another within 10 years' time. Historians suggest that more Puerto Ricans classified others as white because it was advantageous to do so at that time. In those years, census takers were generally the ones to enter the racial classification. Due to the power of Southern white Democrats, the U.S. Census dropped the category of mulatto or mixed race in the 1930 census, enforcing the artificial binary classification of black and white. Census respondents were not allowed to choose their own classifications until the late 20th and early 21st centuries. It may have been that it was popularly thought it would be easier to advance economically and socially with the U.S. if one were white. <laughs> African influence in Puerto Rican culture The descendants of the former African slaves became instrumental in the development of Puerto Rico's political, economic and cultural structure. They overcame many obstacles and have contributed to the island's entertainment, sports, literature and scientific institutions. Their contributions and heritage can still be felt today in Puerto Rico's art, music, cuisine, and religious beliefs in everyday life. In Puerto Rico, March 22 is known as Abolition Day and it is a holiday celebrated by those who live in the island. Language Many African slaves imported to Cuba and Puerto Rico spoke Bozal Spanish, a Creole language that was Spanish-based, with Congolese and Portuguese influence. Although Bozal Spanish became extinct in the 19th century, the African influence in the Spanish spoken in the island is still evident in the many Congo words that have become a permanent part of Puerto Rican Spanish. Music Puerto Rican musical instruments such as barils, drums with stretched animal skin, and Puerto Rican music dance forms such as bamba or plena are likewise rooted in Africa. Bamba represents the strong African influence in Puerto Rico. 
Bamba is a music, rhythm and dance that was brought by West African slaves to the island. Plena is another form of folkloric music of African origin. Plena was brought to Ponce by blacks who immigrated north from the English-speaking islands south of Puerto Rico. Plena is a rhythm that is clearly African and very similar to calypso, soca and dance hall music from Trinidad and Jamaica. Bamba and Plena were played during the festival of Santiago Street. James, since slaves were not allowed to worship their own gods. Bamba and plena evolved into countless styles based on the kind of dance intended to be used. These included luro, yuba, cunha, babu and belen. The slaves celebrated baptisms, weddings, and births with the bales de bamba. Slaveowners, for fear of a rebellion, allowed the dances on Sundays. The women dancers would mimic and poke fun at the slave owners. Masks were and still are worn to ward off evil spirits and pirates. One of the most popular masked characters is the Vejiganta The Vejiganta is a mischievous character and the main character in the carnivals of Puerto Rico. Until 1953, Bamba and Plena were virtually unknown outside Puerto Rico. Island musicians Rafael Cortijo (1928–1982), Ismael Rivera (1931–1987), and the El Conjunto Monterrey Orchestra introduced Bamba and Plena to the rest of the world. What Rafael Cortijo did with his orchestra was to modernize the Puerto Rican folkloric rhythms with the use of piano, bass, saxophones, trumpets, and other percussion instruments such as timbales, bongos, and replace the typical barils, skin-covered barrels with congas. Rafael Cepeda (1910–1996), also known as the Patriarch of Bamba and Plena, was the patriarch of the Cepeda family. The family is one of the most famous exponents of Puerto Rican folk music, with generations of musicians working to preserve the African heritage in Puerto Rican music. The family is well known for their performances of the bamba and plena folkloric music and are considered by many to be the keepers of those traditional genres. Silvia del Villard (1928–1990) was a member of the Afro Boricua Ballet. She participated in the following Afro-Puerto Rican productions, Palisiana y Aquilari and Palisianissima. In 1968, she founded the Afro-Boricua El Coqui Theater, which was recognized by the Pan-American Association of the New World Festival as the most important authority of black Puerto Rican culture. The theater group were given a contract which permitted them to present their act in other countries and in various universities in the United States. In 1981, Del Villard became the first and only director of the Office of Afro-Puerto Rican Affairs of the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. She was known as an outspoken activist who fought for the equal rights of the black Puerto Rican artist. Cuisine <coughs> 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 Nydia Rios de Colón, a contributor to the Smithsonian Folklife Cookbook, also offers culinary seminars through the Puerto Rican Cultural Institute. She writes of the cuisine. Similarly, Johnny Irizarry and Maria Mills have written. Topic: <inaudible> Religion. In 1478, the Catholic monarchs of Spain, Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile, established an ecclesiastical tribunal known as the Spanish Inquisition. It was intended to maintain Catholic orthodoxy in their kingdoms. The Inquisition maintained no rota or religious court in Puerto Rico. However, heretics were written up and, if necessary, remanded to regional inquisitional tribunals in Spain or elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere. Africans were not allowed to practice non Christian, native religious beliefs. No single organized ethnic African religion survived intact from the times of slavery to the present in Puerto Rico. But, many elements of African spiritual beliefs have been incorporated into syncretic ideas and practices. Santeria, a Yoruba Catholic syncretic mix, and Palo Mayambi, Congolese traditions, are also practiced in Puerto Rico, the latter having arrived there at a much earlier time. A smaller number of people practice voodoo, which is derived from Dahomey mythology, Palo Mayambi, or Congolese traditions, existed for several centuries before Santeria developed during the 19th century. Guyama became nicknamed, the City of Witches, because the religion was widely practiced in this town. Santeria is believed to have been organized in Cuba among its slaves. The Yoruba were brought to many places in the Caribbean and Latin America. They carried their traditions with them, and in some places, they held on to more of them. 
In Puerto Rico and Trinidad Christianity was dominant. Although converted to Christianity, the captured Africans did not abandon their traditional religious practices altogether. Santeria is a syncretic religion created between the diverse images drawn from the Catholic Church and the representational deities of the African Yoruba ethnic group of Nigeria. Santeria is widely practiced in the town of Loiza. Sister traditions emerged in their own particular ways on many of the smaller islands. Similarly, throughout Europe, early Christianity absorbed influences from differing practices among the peoples, which varied considerably according to region, language and ethnicity. Santeria has many deities said to be the top or head god. These deities, which are said to have descended from heaven to help and console their followers, are known as Orishas. According to Santeria, the Orishas are the ones who choose the person each will watch over. Unlike other religions where a worshipper is closely identified with a sect, such as Christianity, the worshipper is not always a Santero. Santeros are the priests and the only official practitioners, these. Santeros are not to be confused with the Puerto Rico's craftsmen who carve and create religious statues from wood, which are also called Santeros. A person becomes a Santero if he passes certain tests and has been chosen by the Orishas. <laughs> <laughs> Current demographics As of the 2010 census, 75.8% of Puerto Ricans identify as white, 12.4% identify as black, 0.5% as Amerindian, 0.2% as Asian, and 11.1% as mixed or other. Although estimates vary, most sources estimate that about 46% of Puerto Ricans have significant African ancestry. The vast majority of blacks in Puerto Rico are Afro-Puerto Rican, meaning they have been in Puerto Rico for generations, usually since the slave trade, forming an important part of Puerto Rican culture and society. Recent black immigrants have come to Puerto Rico, mainly from the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and other Latin American and Caribbean countries, and to a lesser extent directly from Africa as well. Many black migrants from the United States and the Virgin Islands have moved and settled in Puerto Rico. Also, many Afro-Puerto Ricans have migrated out of Puerto Rico, namely to the United States. There and in the U.S. Virgin Islands, they make up the bulk of the U.S. Afro-Latino population. Under Spanish and American rule, Puerto Rico underwent a whitening process. Puerto Rico went from around 50% of its population classified as black and mulatto in the first quarter of the 19th century, to nearly 80% classified white by the middle of the 20th century. Under Spanish rule, Puerto Rico had laws such as Regla del Sicar or Gracias al Sicar, which classified persons of mixed African-European ancestry as white, which was the opposite of one-drop rule in U.S. society after the American Civil War. Additionally, the Spanish government's Royal Decree of Graces of 1815 encouraged immigration from other European countries. Heavy European immigration swelled Puerto Rico's population to about 1 million by the end of the 19th century, decreasing the proportion Africans made of Puerto Rico. In the early decades under U.S. rule, census takers began to shift from classifying people as black to white, and the society underwent what was called a whitening process from the 1910 to the 1920 census, in particular. During the mid-20th century, the U.S. government forcefully sterilized Puerto Rican women, especially non-white Puerto Rican women. 0.11% of Puerto Ricans identify as of multi-ethnic ancestry, and generally only as of mixed race. Afro-Puerto Ricans have not had to cope with the same political situation as African Americans, who identified as black in part to collect their political power when trying to gain enforcement of their civil rights and protection of voting. However, in the 21st century, Puerto Rico is having a resurgence in black affiliation, mainly due to famous Afro-Puerto Ricans promoting black pride among the Puerto Rican community. In addition, Afro-Puerto Rican youth are learning more of their people's history from textbooks that encompass more Afro-Puerto Rican history. The 2010 U.S. Census recorded the first drop of the percentage whites made up of Puerto Rico, and the first rise in the black percentage, in over a century. 
Many of the factors that may possibly perpetuate this trend include, more Puerto Ricans may start to identify as black, due to increasing black pride and African cultural awareness throughout the island, as well as an increasing number of black immigrants, especially from the Dominican Republic and Haiti, many of whom are illegal immigrants, and increasing emigration of white Puerto Ricans to the mainland U.S. The following lists only include only the number of people who identify as black and do not attempt to estimate everyone with African ancestry. As noted in the earlier discussion, several of these cities were places where freedmen gathered after gaining freedom, establishing communities. The municipalities with the largest black populations, as of the 2010 census, were San Juan, 73,538 Carolina, 40,310 Bayamon, 21,373 Loiza, 19,314 Ponce, 14,896 The municipalities with the highest percentages of residents who identify as black, as of 2010, were Loiza, 64.3% Arroyo, 32.5% Maunabo, 30.4% Vieques, 28.1% Culebra, 26.6% Rio Grande, 24.6% Guyama, 22.9%, Carolina, 22.8%, Canavanas, 21.6%, Luquillo, 20.8%, Patillas, 19.9%. Notable Afro Puerto Ricans Topic. See also List of Puerto Ricans immigration to Puerto Rico series Cultural diversity in Puerto Rico Chinese immigration to Puerto Rico Corsican immigration to Puerto Rico French immigration to Puerto Rico German immigration to Puerto Rico Irish immigration to Puerto Rico Jewish immigration to Puerto Rico Spanish immigration to Puerto Rico Puerto Rican people History of women in Puerto Rico Afro-Caribbean Afro-Latin American, North, Central and South America Black Hispanic and Latino Americans, United States of America Black people List of topics related to black and African people